Welcome to all of you zooming in from California, Australia, South Carolina, Texas, West Virginia, and other parts of the world that please put your location in the chat if you'd like. We're here to celebrate some of the artists from the Art of Empathy, the Weed Women's Eco Art Dialogue online exhibition, which will be online from November 15th through February 15th of 2023. I'm Mary White, the co-chair of WEED with our team, co-chair Manush Zomaradinia, Christina Bertia, the organizer of this event, and Tanya Geis, board member and juror of the exhibition. We're here to sell, so, uh, Weed Women's Eco Artist Dialogue was founded in 1996 and is a volunteer run collective of women, female identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. And if you wish, please add your land acknowledgement in the chat. Weed's office sits on the territory of the Wichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County, near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize the Mowekma Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the association of Rometush Ohlone who are researching and revitalizing and preserving Rometush Ohlone history and culture, and the confederated villages of Lejeune and Sokorate Land Trust who are working to return native land back to the indigenous stewardship. In fact, a piece of property in Berkeley last couple of months. A little Zoom housekeeping. We're recording this presentation. Please keep your audio muted during the presentation and the host may mute you if there's extra noise. If you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat for the questions section after the presentation. And um, I will, now I'd like to introduce Tanya Geis who will be leading the discussion. Uh, thanks so much, Mary. Um, it's really exciting to see all these folks here. Uh, my name is Tanya Geis. Uh, I was asked to be juror for this exhibition. Um, and I am also a board member of WEED. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am currently in Hong Kong, uh, which is where I'm from, visiting my parents. Uh, but I am normally based in Berkeley, uh, on Zia territory at the Chichonye speaking. Being Ohlone. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Weed for asking me to be juror. Um, it's been a really interesting and wonderful experience. Uh, Weed does really vital work recording and providing a platform for women identified artists working in the fields of social and environmental justice. I really wanted to thank also all the participating artists for submitting such wonderful and diverse work and also the exhibition committee uh, for coming together to put on such a stunning and uh, successful exhibition. And I especially wanted to call out uh, Christina Bertea and Diana Pendel um, in particular for their their leadership in organizing the exhibition and also uh, organizing and putting together the presentation for um, this talk. So today we will be hearing from nine of our 20 artists in the exhibition. There will be um, a second part to these talks. The other one will be happening on January 31st, which is a Tuesday. Um, and I think we will have about eight artists speaking then as well. And I really hope all of you can join. Um, so each of the artists will be speaking for about five minutes about their practice and their works in the show. And then at the end, we will have some time for questions and discussion. Um, so 
The works presented in The Power of Empathy together tell a rich story about how empathy, when channeled through art, has enormous potential to nurture intimacy, connection, and love between humans, and also to inspire cross-species and cross-ecological witnessing, mourning, embodiment, and care. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about each of the artists work. Um, and for the most part, we're gonna work through uh, all of the artists alph alphabetically. And so Catherine Boland's work um, is AI generated. Um, it features four backlit figures shrouded by swaths of translucent plastic. It asks us to place ourselves in the experience of our human kin impacted by our waste stream. Lauren Elder stages a funeral for extinct species complete with gravestones and mourners, demanding that we acknowledge, honor, and grieve for those species with the same gravity as we would the loss of human life. Catery Gladys's video trains our gaze on a crane fly clinging to an airplane window as the plane begins to take off. As the video progresses, we feel ourselves becoming increasingly and urgently invested in the insect's efforts and its survival. Isabella La Roca Gonzalez's luminous portraits of a deer and squirrels left for dead on the roadside, portrayed almost as suspended in space, ask us to pause and sit quietly with the loss of life that we might otherwise speed right past. Betsy Jager's tender portraits of her brother, who lived with Down syndrome and autism, propose the possibility that he may have shared a closer perceptual connection with other species than with humans. They are also testament to Jager's loving curiosity about how her brother perceived the world around him. T.C. Moore's tactile, minimalist topographies made using horsehair speak directly to our own bodies dissolving the distance between ourselves, other animals, and the landscape itself. Azeen Siraj's powerful video pairing landscape footage with voice messages left between Siraj in America and her mother in Iran, explores connection, love, and loss across national borders and time zones amidst a global pandemic. Siang Min Yu's brightly colored paintings depict naked human figures frolicking and interacting with the land and waterscapes, seeming to simultaneously emerge from them and dissolve back into them. The first of Christina Bateo's sculptures shows a female figure and a serpent locked in an embrace, while the other, an almost, an almost figure, is created from various well-worn accoutrements of human physical labor. Through mythic union of human and snake and the tactility of work, we are reminded that our relationships with other humans and other animals are grounded in the physicality of the body. And so without further ado, I would like to start the slideshow. Um, let me start. Oops. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes. Great. Um, and so I'm gonna be the one controlling it. Just let me know when to the next image. Catherine, would you like to start? Yes, I will start. Um, I just like to acknowledge firstly that I'm living on the land of the Yuan Nation and pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Um, thank you for inviting me to enjoy this discussion today. I'm an Australian artist working across the disciplines of painting, photography and digital media. I live on the southeast coast of Australia, a region that was devastated in the Black Summer bushfires three years ago. Many of you will remember watching the global news coverage of the fires. This work, Plastic People, has its origins in that terrible time. It's estimated that the fires burnt 94,000 square miles and that 3 billion native animals were burnt to death. 
We call them the forever fires because they raged out of control for two whole months. The entire country was traumatised in grief and the repercussions are still being felt today. The empathy and compassion, compassion Australians felt for our unique and precious wildlife, which continued to die from horrific burns and starvation due to loss of habitat was intense. These climate change related fires also engendered empathy for fire impacted communities in California and other parts of the world devastated by bushfires. During the fires, I felt utterly helpless and useless and in their wake, I decided to use my skills and my platform as a professional artist to raise awareness about climate change. In late 2020, I was invited to participate in Output Art After Fire, an international bilateral project supported by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade through their Cultural Diplomacy Grants Program, which assisted artists in Southeast Australia and the American West to create artwork about their bushfires experiences. More recently, four of my video artworks were screened by Ocono TV at the Art Speaks Out exhibition held at the COP27 UN Climate Conference in Egypt. Plastic People is an extension of the large body of work I produced for the Output Art After Fire project. These images, co-created with artificial intelligence, an incredibly powerful tool for actualizing concepts around climate change, depict a future generation of young people surrounded and weighed down by plastic waste. Plastic waste is a, is a pervasive problem that's been growing for decades. Plastic can be found everywhere on the planet, in drinking water and food, in the ocean, in deserts and in mountains. Microplastics have even been detected in human lungs and blood. It's estimated that around 8.3 billion tonnes of plastic have been produced since the 1950s, and much of it has ended up in landfills or the natural environment. This plastic waste can take hundreds of years to break down, and in the meantime, it poses a threat to wildlife, the ecosystem, our oceans and human health. One of the key reasons that plastic waste has become a prop, such a problem is a lack of empathy for future generations. Many people use plastic products without thinking about the long-term consequences of their actions. They may be convenient and inexpensive in the short term, but they create a huge burden for future generations who will be left to deal with it all. To protect future generations from the harmful effects of plastic waste, we have to take action now. This means reducing our reliance on single-use plastic products and finding ways to recycle and repurpose the plastic waste we do use. It also means supporting efforts to clean up existing plastic pollution and prevent further contamination of our oceans and ecosystems. We must also consider the impact of our actions on future generations when making decisions about plastic production and consumption. We can support policies and organisations that are working to address the plastic waste problem, which could include supporting the implementation of plastic bag bans, backing companies that are developing sustainable alternatives to plastic, and advocating for increased funding for waste management and recycling programs. Empathy for Future Generation also extends to supporting research and education on the issue of plastic waste. By learning more about the problem and its powerful solutions, we can better understand the impact our actions have on the world and make more informed decisions. We can also educate others and put pressure on local governments and state and federal members of parliament to address the issue and encourage them to take action. Empathy is the ability to, to, ability to understand and share the feelings of others. It is a crucial component of being a responsible and compassionate member of society. So empathy for future generations is an important consideration when it comes to plastic waste. It's up to us to make the necessary changes because the choices we make today will have long-term consequences for the health of our planet and the well-being of future generations. I hope people are moved by these images, that they open hearts and encourage us to think about and reduce our plastic consumption and work towards creating a bit better future for us all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next up we have Lauren Elder. Um, good evening to everybody. Let oh. me know when you want me to switch to the video. Okay, I'll just say a couple of words and then and then you can go. I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Um, Thanks. The first piece that we're going to be looking at is a, a video that um, I did not create. It, it is um, produced by Doug Lavelle and Feather Dodge who are members of the East Bay chapter of Extinction Rebellion. And it was a serendipitous byproduct um, 
of COVID. Um, I had approached the group originally about making a series of tombstones that would be used in their street actions as a portable cemetery. So we could block intersections or Chase Bank or Wells Fargo Bank or wherever we happen to be. But with the advent of COVID, we could no longer meet on the street uh, in numbers. And these two enterprising um, individuals decided to organize members of the group um, to create a video that was staged at the El Cerrito Cemetery. So you'll be seeing that, and then you'll we'll wrap up with the portable cemetery. Um, I was the person who started the project, and I was inspired by my frequent walks through Mountain View Cemetery, which is nearby to my home in Oakland, California. It was created by um, Olmsted, who also created Central Park and Stanford Campus and um, many other prominent landscapes in the United States in the 19th century. And Mountain View Cemetery um, is an absolutely extraordinary Victorian fantasia on death. There are elaborate, elaborate monuments created by the prominent families who um, first started the, um, the cemetery. Uh, everything from pyramids to faux Greek temples or faux Roman temples. And as I would walk through the 200 acres, I started to think, look at all the energy that we invest in remembering each other. Why are we not investing an equal amount of energy in honoring our um, the other life that shares the planet with us, on whom we're dependent? And um, why is it that, that we don't even know their names or what they look like? And so I approached this climate activist group who loves to use um, visual and performing arts as a method to reach the public. And I said, what do you think of, of doing a tombstone project that we're, so that we can carry pieces in procession and, and bang them down and create instant um, cemeteries to call attention to this issue? And they they opened their arms and embraced the project. They didn't even think twice about it. And so they started showing up for community bills here at my um, workshop, you know, with wheat paste and ground paper and paper boxes. We started fashioning these. and um, And then we had to set the project aside briefly because of COVID. But as I said earlier, they took it upon themselves to create this very powerful video that doves tails with the COVID issue and they put it up on YouTube. So we can look at that now. It's about three and a half minutes and I can keep talking or commenting um, as it goes along. I love to work collaboratively. It's, it's the form that makes the most sense to me. Um, normally what I do is community design build projects um, for schools and community sites. You have one minute. Okay, then I guess we're not going to watch the video. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Sorry about that. But you, um, you, you can actually go to it through a link by go. clicking on the, the image on the site and see it yourself. Um, and I guess I wanted to say one other quick thing. I spent a, uh, more and more time going to Latin America uh, process that I started in 2008 to work with groups there. And um, that has given me great empathy for the perspective of those who live south of the border. Um, um, I'd also like to thank Berta Alexander, who's the coordinator currently for um, XR's art brigade, let's call us, uh, for helping with a lot of these pieces. Um, Phoebe Ackley, who's with WEED, and also Lisa Zimmer Chu, who's with WEED, also contributed. But there were many, many, many volunteers who came and um, spent hours creating these um, pieces. Time up. OK, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I apologize for the little hiccup with the it's all right, people got to see a bit of it. 
Okay, great. That should entice them to go back and see the whole thing. And the music is by Samuel Barber is stunning. Okay, so well, we are actually, okay. So next we have Kateri Gladys. And would you like me to start the video immediately? Um, sure. Okay. Should I, should I go? Yes, please start. Thank you. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tanya, for including me. Um, thank you for we for sponsoring the show and just being here, and Christina for helping to um, organize and be in contact. I feel really fortunate to be part of such an amazing group of artists. Um, I live on the ancestral ter territory of the Putano and Seminole peoples, and right now I'm talking to you from the ancestral and current territory of Cherokee. Um, I guess in terms of just my art practice in general, I live in what used to be rural North Florida, now a rapidly changing landscape where timber forests and agricultural lands vanish daily, replaced by homogenous suburban sprawl. Um, my art practice oscillates between local food systems and managed forests, often punctuated by investigation, investigations in the hyperlocal of my backyard and personal encounters with nature, nature being quotation marks, which I'm, this piece is today. Um, making is a methodology that allows me to vigilantly attend to the world, natural world at multiple and simultaneous scales. Simultaneous scales. Um, my hope is that the, to invite the audience um, with my work and to so that they'll implicate themselves in sort of the very ordinary circumstances of the world. Um, I'm gonna start with the story of this piece. I was on a plane waiting to take off at the airport in Birmingham, Alabama, and I noticed a bug in the window. Um, it was raining, the weather outside was super hot and humid as it is in the Southern part of the United States in July. Um, the plane was very cold, but it wasn't immune to the humidity. Um, so I always find that really interesting, like you're in this sort of hermetically sealed or supposedly hermetically sealed sort of container um, and the outside still um, impacts. Um, so I looked closer and noticed it was a crane fly. And the more I stared at the crane fly, examining the body and the wings and finally the eyes. Um, and then from my estimation, the crane fly was looking. And I don't know if I can say anything more. I noticed the vast difference in the scale between me and the crane fly. And I kept thinking as the engines and the turbines powered up that the crane fly would fly away. Um, and the fact that the crane fly was like looking into the window really struck me. Um, I guess the crane fly was looking at me, but I don't know. Um, but in that moment, I thought the weather, the interaction between the sound of the plane inside and outside, the insect and the water droplets streaming on the window, I also noticed a high level of incongruity between the background of the jetway, which is totally a, a devoid again of what we might consider nature in quotation marks and how we consider jetways are non-places. Um, you know, and so unless we're attending to the landscape, um, uh, urban airport jetways all look the same, but they're really not. And I guess I was thinking with everyone talking like what would happen if there was an land acknowledgement every time we got on a plane. Anyways, I'm getting off track. Um, I felt like I was having a moment um, in which I was present to the crane fly. And part of me wanted to continue having a moment. I was torn, but I, so I decided to pull out my phone and started to film and then examine the fly in a different way, but hopefully with care. Um, crane flies are pretty interesting um, in that they're often mistaken um, as giant mosquitoes, which they're not. Um, although they can be kind of terrifying when they pop out at you at night sometimes. Um, they don't bite. Um, in fact, by the time the actual crane fly becomes like a crane fly, not a larva anymore, um, they're at the end of their sort of 10 to 15 day life. Um, and they're thinking about mating and not necessarily eating. And if they do eat, they feed on flower nectar, which I thought was really interesting. Um, for many people, they're considered a pest um, because in their larval form, they'll eat the roots um, of grass, but maybe they're trying to tell us something um, in terms of lawns. Um, so in thinking about empathy or being kindred or more than human species interaction, we usually don't think about bugs or, uh, bugs or 
bugs or insects. Um, this interaction really caused me to wonder about how we as humans relate to insects, especially those that are not necessarily aesthetically pleasing or our awareness of their insects um, between the world, like bees and butterflies or adversaries like mosquitoes and cockroaches. Um, the encounter with the crane fly changed me and made me think. Um, and when I noticed their larvae and to the present, when I noticed their larvae, which are called leather jackets, um, I take care not to disturb their important work of making soil. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kateri. Um, our next artist is Isabella LaRocca Gonzalez. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone uh, who was involved in putting this show together. Um, I've really loved looking at the work and um, it is ultra clear to me that empathy is essential to all social justice movements and in fact, to the survival of our planet. Um, so my work has long been focused on ecological concerns, especially concern for non-human animals. It seems self-evident that environmentalism and social justice must include the other animals who share our planet. The title of this piece is Venado, which is Spanish for deer, and it's from my new series entitled Ofrendas. Um, that is Spanish for offering. Um, the series began with photographs of animals I find dead on the road. Their deaths are unnatural and violent. Five years ago, after 21 years in the San Francisco Bay Area, I moved to rural Kentucky. And on my walks near the lake where I live, I see even more dead animals than I saw in the more urban areas where I've always lived. And I always felt it was deeply wrong to leave their bodies on the road for further violence. I wanted to do something to in some way commemorate them. And for a long time, all I could do, all I could think to do was photograph them and whenever possible, move them off the road. I was inspired by the Mexican ritual of making offerings to the dead, which is where the word ofrendas comes from. And so I decided to try to offer their souls a beautiful place. So I started digitally removing the animals from the context I photographed them in and then making archival pigment prints of them on cotton watercolor paper and then painting a new environment for them. Could you move to the next slide, Tanya? Oops. Thank you. Um, the name of this piece is Ardillitas, which is Spanish for little squirrels. So strictly speaking, these animals are wildlife, but they don't get the kind of sympathy that wild animals who don't live in our neighborhoods or who are endangered. For example, elephants or polar bears or rhinos or tigers or lions. Squirrels and raccoons and possums and voles and mice and snakes, all of which are included in this work, are often regarded as pests and intentionally hunted or poisoned even though it is human behavior that has caused the ecological imbalances that we then kill them in often brutal ways to try to manage. At best, they are considered collateral damage in our car-centered way of life. In the US alone, one to two million vertebrate animals are killed by vehicles every day. There is some good news. There are efforts being made to monitor where many animals cross highways and roads and to create infrastructure that will prevent some of these deaths. One example is, is the Snoqualmie Pass wildlife overpass on I-90 in Washington states, but other solutions are required. Much lower speed limits would avoid more, more wildlife deaths. And of course, a more robust, reliable national train system would reduce the need for cars. These solutions would also have the added benefit of reducing the need for fossil fuels. Um, so it would just be a win, win, win. Um, these solutions are win, win, win solutions. Um, so that's all I have prepared to say. If you wanna 
go on to the Great. next thank you thank you so much isabella uh, next up we have betsy jager good evening thank you to everyone who organized this exhibition and to everyone who is here tonight i'm honored to be included my name is betsy jager i live in west virginia where the environment has been devastated by fossil fuel extraction my paintings have long been about our connection or disconnection from the natural world. The paintings here contain images of my younger brother, John, based on some of the many family photos taken over the years. John was diagnosed with Down syndrome soon after birth. He was never able to be independent and was mostly nonverbal, though I was never sure if that was by choice or necessity. Despite that, he had distinct personality and attitude. It was years later that he was also diagnosed with autism, which was little understood then, but I now recognized, explained many of his quirks and behaviors that were not typical of Down syndrome. But it wasn't until I read Temple Grandin's books that I finally got some insight into how he may have experienced his world. Temple Grandin is an autistic woman with a PhD in animal behavior who has written eloquently about how her emotions and sensory perceptions work. She has explained how most people think in a linear left brain dominant way while she perceives stimuli in a more whole brain way, the way animals do. This allows animals, especially in a predator prey relationship the ability to react quickly to danger. Left brain linear thinking makes language possible. So perhaps that explains why John was mostly nonverbal. I began to see my autistic brother as a link to understanding how other species exist and survive in the world. So John became a metaphor for our connection to the natural world. This first painting is called July 4th. It is oil paint on a wood panel. It shows John sitting on the front steps watching a July 4th parade. The steps fade into a blurred view of two American eagles in flight. I cut out and misaligned the middle section to convey the disconnect and the reality between the flag and the eagles, two symbols of our country, one abstract, while the other is a very real wildlife. Uh, could we have the next image, please? Thank you. The second painting, Bronze Fox, shows John on the back porch. We grew up along the Fox River in Illinois, west of Chicago, where the bridge across the river had concrete figures of foxes along the balustrades. The concrete foxes were later mass produced in bronze and found a big local market. Both John and the Bronze Fox are inside separated from the natural world outside. The bronze fox is looking out to the world of light and vegetation. John looks into some undefined space caught between the two worlds. Could I have the next image, please? Thank you. Looking through the moon shows John as a little kid with the family dog. The dog showed an empathy and tolerance for John that he didn't show to anyone else, sensing a bond perhaps. John is looking at an older picture of himself sitting with our grandfather. Perhaps John was wondering how he fit into the family picture as the full moon obscures his view. Growing up with the brother I never could have a conversation with has always left me wondering about how he felt about life. Uh, working on these paintings has helped me just a little bit share a bit of his world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. Next up, we have T.C. Moore. Um, hello, everyone. It's um, a pleasure uh, to be here. I live in uh, Santa Rosa, California, and I'm a post-minimalist, as I've been told, um, environmental artist who uses an array of low impact ecological materials often from nature that reflects upon our connection or disconnection to plants, animals, and the earth. Um, 
often in my work, I try to conjure up all three at once. Um, in, in this exhibition um, are three works from a series that I've titled, Are We Not All Animals? Question mark. I want to ask the question, you know, are we not all of the land? Are we not the same as the creatures which inhabit it? And if we are, don't they deserve our empathy, the same that we can offer each other? Um, my work with horsehair uh, came from my love of horses. And uh, one spring day, I was curry combing the belly of a horse which horses typically love because they can't reach or scratch that particular spot. Um, the curry comb became full of hair and the wind caught it and the hair blew around and then fell onto the ground. Um, most often um, this hair is thrown into the garbage or you know, just blows away in the wind. But when I saw the delicate pattern that the curry comb had made with the hair, um, it was like an inverted shadow, and I saw its inherent beauty, and since then I've been working with the horsehair. This particular piece um, on the exhibition, it's shown a little bigger than I think it is in real life. It's only eight inches by eight, eight inches. Um, but this one is called, um, Are We Not All Animals? Number five, question mark. Um, and it's made from uh, felted horsehair from shedded winter coats. Um, the horsehair is a symbol for me. It symbolizes nature, beauty, power, and the flow of energy. And like in the Blackfoot Nation, whose land I grew up on in Canada, I feel like it's a protector of life's journeys, both physical and spiritual. In this piece, um, the hair is organized in folding horizontal strata, piled one on top of the other, connecting earth and animal. Um, can I get the next slide, please, Tanya? Um, my second piece, um, with the exciting title of, Are We Not All Animals? Number 20, question mark, um, uses tail hair that are inserted into small drilled holes um, in a 24 inch wide circumference panel. And they're arranged concentrically from white on the outside, gray on the inside and black in the very middle. Experientially, what I wanted was the viewer's eye to be drawn into the center of the circle. And working with the horse hair is like working with a material that has a mind of its own. And when placed in these drilled holes, um, it goes slightly left, right, up and down, which helps create this ephemeral fuzzy quality. Um, it, this is not an issue of bad photography. Um, and if I could have the last slide, um, the third piece, are we not all animals number 29 question um, mark. This piece is made by inserting main hair um, into a 36 inch wood panel. And this hair is much softer uh, and like the tail hair, it reminds me of times that I've spent with horses. I chose white and black hair because I wanted to indicate that the light hair helps define the dark hair and the dark hair helps define the light hair. But more importantly, I wanted to show interconnection and I believe it is in this connection where the power of empathy lies. And uh, that's it for me. Wonderful, thanks so much, TC. Uh, next up we have Azeen Siraj. And this was the image that Azeen submitted, but we're gonna switch the video. 
Um, I can actually like start with the image and then we can switch the video um, in just a little okay. bit. Yeah. Just yeah. Let thanks. Me, uh, let me know when. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks everyone for putting this together. And um, so um, my name is Azine and I'm from Iran and um, Canadian citizen also living here. Uh, so I have been living as a transnational citizens um, most of my life. Uh, and I primarily work with um, photography, video, and video installation. Um, what you see here, the title is 9,272.7 miles. It's um, Googling the distance from my childhood home in Iran to where I reside in Alameda slash California right now. Um, and, and the work, um, uh, it's um, maybe now we can switch to the um, video. It basically, it's about, um, um, it's, yeah, the work is about um, um, universal human experience of, uh, in particular, immigrants of um, um, holding on to love, growing your connection, um, and building your empathy across borders. Um, the, the, the video is basically using the archive um, voicemails between my mother and I. Um, so um, uh, I, and it's from 2011 till like 2020. Um, and it's a selection of that. And the way that I've curated these um, messages together, they go back and forth and you're in different places. One place like I might be in um, um, US and she'll be in Iran or she's in Canada, I'm in, U.S. or I just am leaving, so uh, it's 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 a um, it's a kind of a connection. It, it speaks to itself, so it's like that the the dialogue between me and my mother are the compass for the viewer to not only understand about our relationship but also finding their own personal relationships in it. Um, and you can you can there is a, a very intimate tone and longing. Um, for our, our, you know, to, to join each other. You can see this and, and, and feel that. And I feel like it, it, it is very familial. Um, and the footage that I use, um, they're a combination of the archives that I've collected over the years of um, um, whenever I would leave Iran or Vancouver to visit or from, I would uh, film my, like film the travels, or it could be also like being on the road. There's places that are ephemeral in a way that is passing, this passing um, sort of um, destiny, like passing to get to your destination. Um, so, um, uh, and this is a work that I um, uh, created two years after my mom, passed away we were very close together and she um she passed away from covid and while we were in lockdown i was in uh in california and she was in iran and it was uh still to this day the hardest loss of my life um so um so this was my attempt to sort of finding a um um like a cathartic experience and also to try to um, memorialize our connection in one, like in a creative way. Um, so maybe we can just like play just whatever minutes that we have left, because um, just leave it, yeah. If you can have it, the sound actually. Sure. Is that loud enough? Yeah, it's, it's good, yeah, it's good. Um, so you just wanted to use that as a part of it. Um, it seems like the sound is actually not really coming through on my end but that's okay i can just leave it at that I'll turn it up a little bit. Yeah, thank you. That's um that's I'll up. All right. 
All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. One second. Okay, so next up we have Xiang and Yu. Hi everyone, <laughs> thank you for making uh, this event happening, Tanya and Christina and everyone. Uh, my name is Hong Min Yu and I'm an artist working on body of the work that a large format of painting and life-size sculptures. So I recently just finished a 10 by, 10 by 18 foot painting. So I'm really excited, excited about that. And I'm, I'm working uh, the several installations and performance, which is more like a very figurative uh, work. So recently, uh, uh, I'm currently being successful to bring together all my old art practice in Korea and integrate integrated them in Western art to make them whole. Uh, I have lived in United States for seven years, and I currently have a Master of Fine Art. And I have been lucky enough to be invited to do my uh, one-person show and installation in the greater Bay Area for the last couple of years. And so I have been active doing work, work demonstrating on uh, East West brush techniques. So I um, have a merged both technique into a new approach of painting. Okay, I would like to talk about more like my wake up call painting. This uh, work is about the wake up call for human rights. So the other side of word is the sea. This particular painting depict a seaman who has the color of a sea cucumber <laughs> sleeping and a woman who is a land creature going down and wake him up and she's holding her head uh, up and uh, kind of the pose is like a giving a pose to the idea that there is a transparent sea in the piece so so we're not sure if she is part of the sea or part of the land so I want to say this is about economy relationship so one is colorful and the one is not. The man has simply given up uh, on, uh, is not active. And also the color, the figure, the woman is kind of the showing her motivations and her kind of active or power. So it's kind of the, this is a pre represent a push-pull relationship. It, represent dichotomy of a powerful figure versus weak man. Okay. And so, uh, uh, so my work is not only just uh, the human conditions and like a human living in society uh, with the economy, the, the status or and also I'm working, I'm, I'm making art about like uh, the woman's power. It's like a woman's, the social economy and uh, what kind of woman life rights have because uh, my life is like, I have dealt with the sexism in Korea and America. And sometimes it is overt sexism from the mouth of the men's or the Korean, uh, Korean and American men, but I have also battled uh, on the present culture sexism in Korea. So, the Tanya, you talk to me? 
I and think that I, was a one minute warning. Oh, okay. So, okay. Can you go to the next slide next to work? So this work is uh, our critical painting of the black woman and white woman is considered extremely unusual like our art history. So the black woman is above the white man, woman and they feel uh, the social relevant uh, reversed, but may it's really relevant to current the contemporary culture. So I'm the artist of color. And I think it's like a, the re, these days, the art kind of make us kind of intellect each other, whether or not we are different colors. I'm up. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Thank you so much, Salman. Okay, and our last artist is Christina Bertea. Christina, you're muted. Thank you everyone for participating. And this piece is called Brushing Up Against Each Other, A Thousand Points of Connection. It's all about the primacy of touch and sensory experience. There are thousands of things that we humans each have in common with every other human being, because we are after all critters who share similar sensory experiences of the world. Perhaps we can get past our recoil at some of each other's ideas, beliefs, and identities if we can return to our physicality as our common ground. Maybe it's through rubbing shoulders with each other, through close contact and shared activity, through touch and laughter, that we can find empathy for each other. The mind that abstracts can be an obstacle with all its attachments to left and right, right and wrong, us and them. It's much easier to objectify each other when we're not in contact and there's no physical familiarity. This little munchkin has hands that have known the earth intimately, has wood clamp legs that hold things close together, has scrub brushes with luxuriant real hair that are making those thousand points of connection with each other. And the hairs remind us of our lungs where thousands of delicate life-giving exchanges are constantly taking place between our blood and the air around us. Speaking of beliefs, I believe artists must play a crucial role as social critics. In that vein, this piece is also a commentary on recent quote unquote public health policy that has enforced separation and isolation and incited fear. But we know that fear releases chemicals in our bodies that actually weaken our immune systems. And that lack of touch and physical contact are also detrimental to our immune systems. Research is showing that what's called skin hunger and touch deprivation are real and impactful and do not support the public's health. Now wearing a mask withholds our facial expressions and emotions from each other, which surely must interfere with our access to feelings of empathy. So this piece is a tribute to touch and feeling and relationship with a three-dimensional tangible physical world, which includes each other as vital sources of empathy. Next slide, please, Tanya. So this piece is called Woman and Serpent, Forever Entangled, The Much Maligned Align. This piece is about the natural empathy that arises between beings who share a similar oppression. Both woman and serpent have been reviled in patriarchal Christian mythology for sins having something to do with temptation and sexuality. We see this undercurrent in our culture rearing up now in renewed political efforts to suppress women's sexual freedom. But in matriarchal culture, snakes were celebrated and related to the earth's healing energy and to the feminine principle. Early statues of Mary show the snake coiling up her leg, preserving her connection to earth's wisdom. But over time, with the triumph of the patriarchy, the sculptures devolved into Mary crushing the snake under her foot. I've always loved snakes. I like to catch and release them so I can enjoy a few moments of their squeeze and flow movements on my hand and arm. In my many years of immersion in shamanism, I have enjoyed the practice of merging with other beings and certainly with snakes, which has deepened my affinity for them. For me, they reference that streaming vegetative life force energy that some can see in living things with the help of medicine plants. I once knew a medicine teacher of sacred sexuality who shared a story that really stuck with me. He spoke of an elegant woman 
who presented with her large serpent ally at high level, high dollar private events for executive men. I gather these were essentially ceremonies invoking the divine feminine and were reportedly received with great reverence and respect by the men. One can only imagine what such a ceremony might have been like, and perhaps that was the intent of the story. So I brought all of my own personal experience with snakes into the carving of this piece. The beautiful earth goddess-like woman is being embraced by the snake. She's sitting on it and her back is supported by it, while the snake's tail is activating her heart chakra. The snake is opening her third eye with the flick of its tongue, bestowing intuition and psychic gifts. It's clear that there is a strong resonance, one could say empathic connection between woman and snake, and snake as symbol of the earth healing energy. So I, I uh, consider myself something of an outsider artist. I don't have art credentials and art degrees, and I work mostly in my basement with found materials here in Oakland, California. I enjoy making art that's provocative and sparks awareness about compelling eco-social issues and especially about our relationship to water and soil. So some of the art I make actually even demonstrates solutions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you all, all of the artists. It's been, I, it's been wonderful. I really appreciate being able to have a window into some of the uh, the background context of the work, um, some of the stories attached to them, and and also the nuances of their creation. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And we're gonna move into the discussion section of the presentation. And I I have one question that I would like to start us off with, and then I will probably pass it on to um, all of you to, uh, to engage in discussion. Um, when I was thinking about what questions I wanted to ask, I, I looked into the, the etymology of the word empathy and um, our current understanding of empathy, uh, generally speaking, would be the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. But the root form of the word actually comes from the Proto-Indo-European en, E-N, meaning in, and pathos. And the root of pathos means to suffer. Um, or that is the root of the word. Uh, and in order to truly feel empathy for another, we must be open to the possibility of suffering. Um, Given the often difficult subject matter in many of the works in this exhibition, as well as the current state of the world, I'm curious to hear how some of you think about your work in the context of suffering, how you navigate it and or hold space for it, um, how you think about it in relation uh, to empathy. And feel free, anyone can you, start the discussion. Do you want me to pin all artists? Yes. Okay. I have um, Oh, this is PT. I'll, I'll be the, the brave person here. Um, I think what you're speaking to is about vulnerability. And when we have true empathy, I guess, versus sympathy for some one thing, person, land, whatever, um, you have to search in your own experience base to try and find a place that is similar or same to the um, entity, sentient being that's feeling this way. So it, it's a tough position because most people don't want to be vulnerable. Um, so I, I, I guess I understand that definition um, in pathos um, because of that. I, I have a response to that. Something I've given a lot of thought to um, because I do, um, I do tend to feel suffering and um, 
that can be really debilitating and can actually keep you from um, really helping or trying to take action to improve the situation. Um, so I find that I have to almost orchestrate my emotions and allow myself to suffer along with whoever, whatever I'm empathizing with. And then Isabella, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but there's some like feedback going on. If everybody could just make sure they're muted, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no problem. Um, yeah, so I, I find that I have to orchestrate my emotions and at times allow myself the to to actually feel all the suffering that I that I see and and witness. And then I just have to shut it off. I, I can't. Otherwise, it becomes paralyzing. Um, so I think that question is really, um, it's a really important question when it comes to empathy, because I think that, you know, you, you can't allow yourself to fall into a pit of suffering or pathos. Um, you have to kind of pick and choose uh, about how you respond to it. Um, Isabella, I can really relate to that after the bushfires, I fell into that pit of despair. I mean, just for two months, you know, knowing that outside there was billions of animals dying and, and I felt helpless and powerless in the face of that. And I think it was not long after the bushfires, I, I felt I just had to do something with my art. I was just compelled to use my art to say something or to, yeah, just to do something positive with reaching out and raising awareness. And it, and it has totally changed my art practice. And I'm used to paint pretty pictures and land, always inspired by the landscape. And now I've completely turned my back on that. And I'm just focused on doing something to raise awareness about climate change. And it has helped with the despair. Um, I'd like to go off of everyone saying, um, I, <clears throat> my work ten, I mean, part of my work, um, uh, stems from autobiographical experiences slash human experiences, universal experiences, such as migration, such as, um, displacement, such as connecting with different space and time, um, building communities, you name it. And I think that, um, and I've been thinking about this a lot because just what, given what's happening in Iran with um, within the past like 12 or 13 weeks of um, feeling our, uh, or just witnessing from far that my people are being killed for protesting just basic human rights. Um, I feel that um, there is a very um, strong uh, sense of empathy that is happening with Iranian diaspora community inside Iran and out. Um, and I also think it's a privilege not to like, um, for instance, um, well, suffering is one thing, but then just the pain, I think not having that pain is, is a privilege, just like it's a privilege to be able to uh, for instance, have uh, be close to your family and have them all one place and you don't have to move from your country for all this other reasons. So I feel for me, I've never had that privilege to think that whether if I would be choosing a non-political or whatnot art, um, it's a part of me, it's part of my DNA, it's part, and, and, and you know, and I've, I've heard some non-Iranians say like, well, what if like you don't, for instance, listen to news or see or read about the stories and of these people. And again, that's a privilege that I don't that I don't have. And also it's a kind of obligation I feel as human being to be engaged with what's happening and, and to try to um try to connect and not to just uh, again, like you know, with empathy. And it's not about like a um to torture myself, but it is uh, I feel it's like an like a moral um ethical duty. I would like to say after Aziz, because I'm uh, the immigrant uh, moving from Korea to United States. And also I still feel the same positions as a woman in Korea and here. And at the beginning, the, when I practice my art is like a 
the creating, the making my voice is kind of sometimes embarrassed. So like, I want to be strong. So I tend to like hide my weakness is showing my strength. But then the getting, you know, practice art more and more and kind of showing that my weakest part has become much stronger. So that means I'm sure my weakness, like uh, the, my position as immigrant and also the woman is like a socially, the woman position is like sometimes they want to see me really elegant, like uh, to take care of the children is like be a mother. I have to be really uh, calm and stable to show to become a, their role model. But sometimes, on the other hand, I'm just a person. Is I'm just a woman. I could have my emotion, and I want to be just myself. But as I'm feeling so conflicted part in my life, so I start when I start to showing my kind of my, the self-empathy is really could be the universal voice to share with the whole woman or the immigrant people. That's kind of, I found out where my empathies come from. Probably self-recognitions self and connect to the people and that connection, I really understand other people. Thank you. Would any of the other artists like to respond at all? Or do you have any questions for each other? I'd like to just say that for me, uh, I feel tremendous empathy, which is in fact, the pain of identifying with the suffering of animals, which are particularly uh, targeted for um, execution is the only appropriate word such as elephants, such as wolves, such as coyotes, uh, you know, it's just, it is absolutely uh, feeling the pain of those animals losing their family connections and their, um, their, their knowledge, their, their uh, experience of how to navigate in the world. It gets passed from generation to generation and not being wiped out by, um, by people who think they have the right to exterminate them. So I just want to say that. Um, if I can jump in, um, <clears throat> I grew up on the edge of the Amazon rainforest um, and left the country when I was a teenager um, grieving, and the grief has continued. Um, and how I how I stay sane, kind of, is by not letting all those creatures go out like lights. Um, I want to keep drawing them and showing people we're coming down to the last so that, because I believe that um, other non-humans um, become extinct in our minds before they become extinct in the world. Um, and so that's how I do it by saying, look, look at the beauty. And the other part is look at what we're doing to destroy. And so I've done things with plastic and food and, I'm kind of tempted to take on big agriculture who kind of knock out millions of chickens or, or they say, oh, we might get the avian bird flu. So let's just wipe out a million um, creatures because they might get it, which drives me crazy. But anyway, it's one way I do it, which is to say, here they are, here they are. And also to pay homage for my myself for their beauty. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to comment and say how struck I've been by how much of the work tonight has dealt with our relationship with animals. I think that's interesting and timely relative to the conference that's going on in Toronto right now. And I was struck by the um, pieces that preceded mine about the images of the roadkill when I walk in the morning, I see a lot of dead animals along the roadside and I look at them and I always stop and apologize to them. 
because I don't know what else to do. And I was wondering how to turn that into an art form. So I want to thank um, the artist for that. So I think as we get older, empathy becomes, um, I think it grows with age, especially I notice I become more empathetic as I get older. So you, I think it, you start to see other people's um, feelings. And I think the idea of suffering is, I mean, life is suffering as Joseph Campbell has said. So um, there's no avoiding that. I don't know, sometimes I think that like empathy is like a hyper object um, because it's like so big and so immense. Like there's so much going on that's so immense. And like, how do we, or it's part of our response to hyper objects. I mean, but it's so, how do you decide like in the midst of like all, like all the despair that's going like, you know, I'm gonna go out and, you know, shoot dead animals today, or, you know, I'm going to go look at the images of my brother, or, you know, are all the, or I'm going to make a, um, you know, some go to the cemetery and do a memorial for animal. And I don't know, like, how do you, like, I, mean, I think art is a little bit about trying to, using empathy to take a little piece of all the despair, or, you know, thinking about something that's ordinary. I don't know, just... Yeah, Katery, I was thinking a little bit along those lines too, like it is this like immense, like the destruction and suffering that we witness in the world is so large and it's so widespread and it exists, you know, through the past, present, and we can see it coming up into the future, especially with climate change. And um, there's this question of it's an old question, but I think it is relevant to this group in particular, like what, what is the responsibility of art towards like action? How much of it is witnessing? How much of our work is intended to inspire change with, within the minds of the people who encounter it? How much do we expect that to, um, inspire behavior to change out in the world. And I'm wondering how all of you um, think about that in your practice. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I could pop into the conversation and um, I, I get utterly overwhelmed by the level of suffering that's going on right this minute in Ukraine or Somalia um, or other parts of the world. Um, and I don't, I don't personally have the tools like a doctor or a master builder to address those in that very direct way. Um, but I always feel very privileged when I have a chance, an invitation to intervene and particularly to work with young people and enable them to experience their power to change their own environment and to become stewards for their environment and to see other possibilities um, for where they live and to make it a better place for themselves. My feeling is that they'll grow up and be better um, adults and more civically and, and more civically and environmentally engaged. So that's the little opening that I find. And that's the one that gives me the most satisfaction. Um, I'm... I'm desperate. I'm desperate to get the message out there as much as I can. I mean, I, uh, George Monbiat um, talks about the 25% tipping point, societal change, and you need 25% of society um, to be politically active and engaged before things change. And so I want to put as much work out there as, as far wide as I, spreadly as I can to try and raise that awareness so that, you know, this 25% tipping point happens and we just say, no, enough for fossil fuels, enough for, you know, the plastic waste, et cetera. Yeah. Mm. 
you know, I, I don't know if this is an answer or anything, but I was at a conference and listening to some women who were working with incarcerated moms and doing like an art program with the kids and the moms and the kids would come to visit. And, um, you know, they were talking about their experiences and, you know, how hopeless a lot of that was. And when, I guess one of the things that they said was like, hope is a discipline, like that you, you know, you need to get up every morning and tell yourself like that, like you have to make yourself hope. And I have that like written on my refrigerator, you know, I have that like, you know, six times, like make myself say that six times. And I don't, yeah, I don't know. That's like tiny, tiny thing. But. I also think um, that it's important for us not to um, follow in the path of a lot of environmental organizations who um, keep on emphasizing how dire it is and how damaging and um, and people get into overwhelm and shut down. Um, and so <clears throat> in some small way, I've been trying to help an environmental group begin to think about what they want to work towards, what their dream of the future could be, and to express it in writing, in stories, um, and, and sometimes in visual art. <clears throat> because that having something to work towards, I think, um, doesn't let hope become extinct. And that's, I think, is terribly important. Um, I think you just touched on something very important that when you focus on, the, on a very local level where you do have control of some degree of control over circumstances and you can see change being manifest, it really does help um, offset the, the overwhelm and the despair. Yeah, I think that's very true. I work with the local chapter of the Sierra Club and we address local issues and we work to get legislation passed in our state government, which is an uphill battle, but focusing on the local and the things you can accomplish is really important. Well, that ties in with what Catherine was saying that if 25% of people were engaged, it would begin to manifest um, in, a, in a tangible way, I think. Yeah, I tend, to, I, I tend to agree more with Greta Thunberg though, that, I mean, you know, hope's great, but we need to be terrified. We need to be absolutely shitting our pants because it's, the fossil fuel production is amping up. I mean, it's just, we, you know, I really, really think we need to frighten people to death because I know everyone's saying, oh, it's overwhelmed, it's overwhelmed, but if everybody has hope, then everybody thinks, oh, well, we don't have to worry, we don't have to do anything. And I just think we should be, people should be really, really scared about what is about to happen and what is happening right now. And Because I, I don't know, it's just, I, I watch the news every day, I'm constantly absorbing this stuff and it is absolutely terrifying. I respectfully disagree. Hope is what lets people keep walking. Hope is what lets people do the things that they need to do to keep, to make things, to ch make a change. If you're in despair, you're not gonna make any kind of change at all. I'm sorry, I just, I, I mean, I appreciate that we do, yes, we need to be extremely thinking about and, and take action based on the, the horrible things that are around us. But I don't, I'm not, I'm not willing to give up hope anyways. I like to really uh, try to make art that embodies solutions and that it makes them look beautiful and enticing and like something that people want to engage in. I think that's that's really where artists have a lot of power is to like acknowledge that things are really dire, but also point point out to people, well, here's what you can do. And, and I am going to make it look really appealing in, in the, what I'm creating. So 
to me, that's that's how I can be effective in the world. So. Okay. Um, this isn't an art practice, but it's something that makes me feel just a tiny bit better each morning. <clears throat> There's an app called Climate Action Now, and they encourage you, it's a free app, they encourage you to make take five actions, which could be writing letters, phoning, or tweeting, which I don't do. Um, and it's it's not art, but it helps free me up to know that my voice is going out to um, to the oil companies, to the politicians, to the banks. And then I can um, feel like something, you know, I did something that um, was a bit more immediate because apparently that counts. So <clears throat> I'd recommend climate action now. I have no um, interest in it other than the fact that it's an easy way to communicate. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, mining and burning fossil fuels today or tomorrow, we can forget about keeping global average temperatures below 1.5. And over 1.5, it's uninhabitable for humans and animals. I mean, this is what we're looking at. I mean, it's just... I mean, it's it's all very well to have hope and we can we can recycle our plastics and we can eat vegan food and all that sort of stuff, which I do all that. But, you know, it's it's these massive conglomerates, these corporations that are not going to change their ways. In fact, they want to try and suck every last ounce they can out of the earth before, you know, they might, will be forced to stop. So it's actually being ramped up. I mean, it's just... I mean, I, I want to have hope, but I'm just looking at what's happening globally with these massive corporations and mining companies and what's happening with Australia and, you know, as just, it's terrifying. Sorry, but I don't have any hope. <laughs> I really don't. Catherine, I, I totally understand how you feel. I have screamed at my, into the void of my house um, about, um, because I, I think change is uh, top down and bottom up. Yes, we can personally do everything possible and, uh, you know, try not to buy packaging and make everything at home and drive as little as possible and et cetera, et cetera. But until the system, the systems change, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, yeah, we can we can eventually get there one by one, tiny piece by tiny piece. But, you know, as Greta Thunberg, who you referred to earlier, says, it's all blah, blah, blah. When all these men get together and it's just not it's just about profit. So I, I totally understand your frustration. Um, for me, that righteous anger is something that I can do my best to channel. Most of it just goes off into the ether because there's not a lot, I don't have a platform. I'm not one of the people in power. I'm not the Murdochs or whoever, but I, I totally understand your frustration. And all I can say is I just do my best to channel, channel that anger into what I can do, what little I can do. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I, um, you know, I, I, just think, well, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I can always hope. Uh, but the fact is that that the bullet is out of the gun. You know, it, it's out. It's not it's not a question of if it's a question of how bad. Um, so the question of mitigating the desire, you know, the, the environmental collapse that we, we're going to experience of meeting it's come down to that now of mitigating that mm. and paying, you know, underdeveloped nations to deal with the consequences of climate change, give them money to help them deal with that. I mean, this is what we're talking about now, you know. It's oh, just, yeah, I'm incredibly, incredibly distressed <laughs> about it. Yeah. But as but I do, but I keep going, I I do have a a, a social media platform, so and I use all of my social media channels. To put out as much as I can, so and to do as much as I can, which is all I I can do. But um, yeah, I'm, we need we need these 
global corporations, these mining companies, to stop doing what they're doing, and they are not stopping doing what they're doing, have no intention of stopping doing what they're doing. And if they don't stop they're doing what we're doing, then, you know, it's all over. Sorry, <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> For what it's worth, XR focuses a lot of their um, activities on interventions with the major banks who finance all of these companies. And so they're constantly involved in doing shutdowns of banking activities, getting people to give up their credit cards, um, revealing where those banks are investing their money, disrupting meetings of um, shareholders. So they're really going at it at that macro level. Um, and uh, I don't know if that kind of activity would appeal to you or not, but they're very thoughtful about, about how they're intervening in the economic engine that is running this whole thing. Um, Lauren, that's uh, something I really admire about your work and something that I'm I tend to be a loner and want to do everything all by myself. I don't, I don't want to have to answer to anybody. And I'm really trying to change that about myself because I think collaboration is, is really essential at this point. So um, I really appreciate how you've been able to, to work with, you know, to collaborate with, with others. I'm going to try to do that more myself. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of comments in the uh, in the chat section um, that uh, I think seem especially relevant. Cynthia Hart wrote, everyone agrees catalyzing change is desired, strategies differ. And I think that's really kind of what we're seeing here. Like there is, there is space for fear, there's space for hope, um, there's space for working solo, for collaborations, for working with uh, younger people, um, and it seems like all of those, those strategies are important because, um, different people would be responsive to different, uh, different points of access. And, and it does seem, yeah, that, yeah, that we need all of those strategies, that we need all those entry points. Um, and let's see, just a couple other comments uh, from Lorraine Bonner. If you aren't afraid, you're not paying attention. If you're not paying attention, you won't do anything to change what is happening. And, and I think that is a lot of what we're doing here is, is calling attention to things, asking people to look, witnessing, creating a space for, for seeing and acknowledging and taking things in. Um, yeah. Did any of you have any other thoughts? Any other questions about each other's work? Maybe. Um, hi, this is Celia. Can you hear me? Yeah, from Alaska, um, um, you know, there's no place probably um, more um, impacted or uh, has been for a long time from climate change. And, um, and yes, I'm terrified too. So I, I really relate to that kind of um, uh, perspective. And um, because we see our glaciers leaving at record speed um, we see invasive species um, coming to Alaska, creating environments in which fires are rampant. Um, and, and so, you know, I understand the fear I, because I have it and I, I, I can't keep that out of my work. Um, I'm, I'm not one of the participating artists today that, that talked, but I will be on the 31st. Um, um, my pieces in the show don't relate to what I'm talking about right now, but, um, but the one thing I, I have been, um, kind of, um, enlightened by or inspired by or, uh, hopeful for 
<clears throat> is that there are small groups here, lots of them, that understand and are fearful too. And they have started uh, projects to, um, uh, like one uh, down where I live on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, where um, they have uh, started this project, let's solarize the Kenai Peninsula. And uh, they're doing so many things like trying to make um, um, building materials out of plastics. So they are um, recycling all these plastics and turning them into um, building materials. And so we have lots and lots of local small projects that together are going to have, I think, huge impacts. And I think that um, there's so much awareness now that there is some reason to hope. And uh, so I just wanted to, to let people know that even here in Alaska, where we are really melting, <laughs> we're trying. And um, so that's a, I think that's a reason for hope. And I'm sure that other communities are doing similar things. So um, I don't think all is, is lost yet. Um, and I think that lots of us are waking up. Hi, I, uh, this is Maya, and I am not a participating artist. However, I would like to respond to the woman from Alaska. Um, when I hear plastics, I'm thinking in terms of new building materials, there's a great space open for creatives to come up with rethinking how we design our buildings because I I was concerned. I heard a story about the Inuit who are being forced to move further and further inland who don't have adequate funding to rebuild their standard construction, what they're used to. And again, the, the native population has to be involved in the process, but we all need to realize that we're moving into a world we've never experienced before. And there are resin-based uh, natural fiber boards that we could use. And I'd like to call on the creatives to participate in rethinking how we're going to house the homeless who are going to be forced to move <laughs> clearly. All the coastal areas that are being impacted uh, are and in addition to just this more severe climate change, we need more disaster housing that is acceptable to a mass population. And it's going to take a great rethinking of what we consider shelter. But anyway, I'm I'm asking that we focus more on regenerative uh, materials that are non-toxic and that can be uh, widely used. If you, if you think about the ancient igloos, they used the native materials, but now those are disappearing along with uh, climate change. And so we have to rethink what will be available. And I sit on the board of a a nonprofit that has been investigating um, an amazing tree called the Megaflora that has multi uses as well as being a beautiful tree. It's a bee fodder and the, the leaves and the flowers are antivirals for foot and mouth disease used in China for centuries. And it <laughs> grows 30 feet in three years and has, it can be used for dimensional lumber. So there are wonderful resources in nature that we have yet to tap for uh, things that we can evolve. And it's gonna take all of us reevaluating how and uh, you know, how we're gonna proceed into this new world. Thank you. Um, Mary, I'm noticing that we are you know, pushing past maybe the time when you're thinking of tying up. Um, how do you want to proceed? Oh, you're muted. 
Well, I think that it's time to close. And uh, I would like, on behalf of Weed and Manoush and myself and everybody who helped um, and special call out to Tanya and Christina for getting all of you artists coming and thank you all the artists. And I think it's time to close. Um, I hope that you can be in touch with each other and I'm gonna give you just a little touch about what WEED is doing right now. We are in the midst of rebuilding our new website the new artist directory and Tanya is actually leading the committee to do that. So we hope to have a new look early in the next year. And please give generously to this vision if you can by going to our website, weedartist.org, um, and we'll put it the address in the chat again. And then also we are a volunteer collective and we're always looking for volunteers to specifically help me with the monthly newsletter, or we are looking for two new board members, one to work with website and one to work with membership. So if you know of somebody who might be interested, please let us know. So thank you all. Thank you all the artists for their enlightening and thoughtful dialogues. And um, may we all start local and do something, even if it feels wrong. Do it. So thank you very much. All of thank you. you so much, everyone.